Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Lisha Zhang from UCLA. Uh, Lisha went to her, join her PhD at MIT in 1981, when really the internet was at its very early nascent stage, and she's been pivotal in its evolution. So for the things she's been known for, for example, the very first IETF meeting in 1986, she was one of the 20 odd participants. This is the standards body of the internet, which was started around 1986. And it's been, she's been contributing to it in various different RFCs and standards and so on. She's known, for example, for her work on reservation protocol RSVP. Uh, she coined the term middle box, which is pretty amazing. And now, of course, she's working on name data networking. So some of the things, I think after her PhD, she went to Xerox, the famed Xerox Park Research Center. And then currently she is the John Postal Chair of Pro uh, Professorship at UCLA. Again, pretty apt there. Uh, so for some of the work that she's done in multicast, uh, RSVP and so on, the lots of RFCs that you can look up and standards. Uh, so she's a fellow of the IEEE and the ACM and also a recipient of the aptly named Internet Award from IEEE. So without further ado, please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Professor Alicia Zhang for the keynote talk. Um, am I on? Yeah, I think I'm on. Oh, I'm very excited to come here, and the thanks to the organizers for this great opportunity. This is my first uh, trip to India. Uh, very exciting to learn this great country. So I want to take this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, uh, internet architecture, uh, something I've been working on since uh, 1981, as the professor mentioned, uh, when I first uh, I went to um, MIT for my uh, PhD. The timing was exactly right. As I walked to the MIT campus, my former advisor, David Clark, said that you know what, the specification for TCP IP just got published. And here is it, read it, it's a hot off print. That was the, uh, the September 1981. And since then, I have done nothing but just reading those TCP IP uh, specifications and see how they actually uh, lit the light and got the whole uh, internet deployed quickly across the globe. Now, why should I take this opportunity to talk about architecture? It's done, isn't it? No, the internet succeeded. Uh, I would say exceeded everyone's expectation. So I think I have two reasons uh, to talk about this, and I hope you agree with me. First and foremost, everything. You can look around everything. It's already got uh, integrated into the internet or otherwise becoming integrated into internet. Uh, very often people these days talk saying that, what if the internet is turned off for an hour? What happens? We couldn't figure out how life would go on without internet for an hour. So given the importance, um, are we done with the architecture when we succeeded? I want to use some positive word to say that we are facing challenges. Um, where come the challenges after is a tremendous success? For one, internet continues to grow, still grow rapidly, uh, not only expand to uh, the developing countries and other areas, but also uh, uh, is penetrating into every corner, even for the developed countries. So like the US was the first place where TCP IP turned on. That actually happened in 83, uh, two years after the specification got published. Uh, but still, uh, now you go home, you, get, you buy some um, an iPod uh, home kit, and you, you turn it on, so all of a sudden, your home got on internet. Uh, so you can watch when I'm here, I could watch what's going on at the home. And the second thing is that it's related. There's a lot of new applications uh, coming online. I'm going to mention some of them uh, we are actually working on. Those new applications really bring uh, new challenges. They are no longer the old 
or file transfer. Otherwise, remote login. How many people still do remote login? But that was the main application uh, when uh, I started uh, looking into this. And there's yet another bullet. I don't want to put it here because everyone knows it already. Security. Security. Um, we are facing an increasing amount of threats uh, on the internet. And I don't think that, uh, I need to say more about that. So with that, I think everyone should care about the um, architecture. You know, the AI and the machine learning may be the head of a line for the day, right? Make a break, break, uh, breakthrough so that something that was totally unthinkable can be done. But you know what? That great machine learning lives on the data as collected by the internet. So if the internet doesn't work, nothing else would work. Now, architecture. I know that uh, for people like me watching this thing for almost 40 years, you, you see it start from nothing and gradually um, growing to a, a global wide systems. So you can see how things get added up. But for later generations, like new students coming to UCLA, when they ask them, have you learned about the internet? Yes, we did. Uh, what did they have learned? Uh, we know the TCP slow start congestion control. Or oh, otherwise, we know how the Wi-Fi works. But uh, it's, uh, it's hard for them to see the bigger picture. And this is what I want to talk about. This bigger picture called architecture. Architecture actually is not complicated. It's pretty simple, as I saw you, show you here. Uh, oh, it's right here. So it's only basically three parts. You may have heard of oh, the seven layer architecture, otherwise five layer. But as a system person, there's really three parts. Uh, there's the transmission, the, the layer two, the protocol runs directly on top of the you know, transmission media uh, that, so that you can deliver the network uh, data. On top of that, there are applications that say that here's the data go deliver from me. Uh, so to the architecture, the middle guy, the middle layer is the most important one because that decides how the underlying uh, communication technologies actually get used and what kind of service the applications on top of that uh, can, can get. In, uh, when you ask people, what is the internet architecture? Some people, I would say majority of the new graduate students, they're gonna draw black architecture. Where have you seen that? Uh, this is in that uh, old RFC published uh, in September 1981, uh, the machine uh, that got handed in and I've been studying it. Day one, when I look at this, I felt, what a bizarre thing. You know, this odd picture and in the middle, uh, IP specification, RFC 791, just show you, oh, there are 20 bytes coded this way. So what? Uh, but as the time went on, I studied more of that. I can recite all the 20 bytes, you know, onward and backward. I start appreciating more. Uh, it's a great design. It's not really something dropped from the sky one day, but rather it's actually years of effort uh, that led to this specification. So I put the mark down there. When the surf and the Bob Khan, the two great fathers of the internet, they actually published a paper in 74. And it takes seven years from that first paper to actually finalize the protocol specification. So uh, I have a good friend, Steve Deeren. Some of you may still remember his name, because all the old names now. Uh, he said, let's draw the picture in a uh, clear way. So that was the first hourglass picture he made when he visited um, UCLA back in uh, 19, I think it's, 98 to give a talk. And uh, he pointed out that that's really the narrow waste. That's the most important part. However simple you think it may be, oh, 20 bytes, so what? Because that's a narrow waste, largely contributed to the success of today's internet. It's so simple. That's why very often you get this so what uh, impression. But because it's simple, they can easily get deployed uh, in so many different places uh, for different platforms and also across countries and across the world. Below the IP, 
so you have a uh, layer two transport. Uh, and I want to point to something, maybe that has not, hasn't been emphasized earlier, that is IP being simple, it also does very simple things. Point to point datagram delivery. Uh, the two words that's really important, I want you to remember. One is point to point data delivery. That is from one address to the next address. This, you think so what? This delivery from one point to the next point is actually inherited from the network before it. That was the telephone network. Um, again, the new generations, you probably started with your smartphones and do not know the old days where we had to pick up the, the wireless phone to the dial apps, and that phone wasn't smart at all. Uh, did nothing but converting your uh, voice into the electrical signals and send it out. When the internet and the IP got uh, derived, it's a great design in that you changed the circuit switch to packet switch. That's a great revolution. Nevertheless, the service model making two points talk to each other did not change. And the second thing is that um, I feel the datagram delivery instead of uh, the phone, which said, oh, I'm going to guarantee you whatever the delays or the qualities uh, of your voice. IP at the time, but whoever wants to learn something about the history, I can have, have lots of stories to tell you because my generation is mostly retired now. Uh, so, and not many people wrote down anything. Uh, it's hard to uh, collect all the stories, but in my early days of graduate school, we got lots of heated debate, say this way, uh, with people who at the time running the telephone systems and seeing that your IP, you guys have no idea what you are doing. Um, the communication system cannot be built on this so-called best effort. Uh, it's really least effort. You drop whenever you want to, and that's not the service. You have to have guarantees. And at the time, there were lots of computations. Uh, they try to provide the guarantee the delay. That's difficult, but mostly they guarantee the delivery of your packet from host A to host B. The end result, the market tells, you know, is the best effort service that you know, eventually win away. So what else can I say? It's very simple, right? But I want to explain to you why this uh, IP designed as a point-to-point -point communication just inherited from the telephony. Because at the time, the dominant applications was logged into remote machines so you can share some very limited resources. This sounds silly uh, for new generations, but back then in the old days, there are not that many machines, um, very few. When I started, I think my, uh, in my department I had a big one called the TOPS20, it's a Honeywell machine, everyone just had an account, you remote log into that. So this point-to-point -point communication uh, model served just just did the job. But over time, we no longer do that. People no longer even know about that was, oh, that's how you get the internet started. These days, I listed a few um, applications that mostly uh, people use on a daily basis. The first few, like the Facebooks, the YouTubes, you know, they've been there for a while. They've been very successful. And they're built directly on top of TCP IP. Uh, However, I would add that they also added the changes um, to the original very simple internet. In the original simple internet, you just have a routing protocol to figure out where packets should go, and packet will go there. TCP will recover from losses, and that's it. That's how remote login works, how the file transfer works. But when you come down to build gigantic data centers, that's no longer adequate. Uh, you cannot everyone log into the YouTube gigantic mainframe to think that it can serve five million users simultaneously. No, they cannot. So people start building functionalities on top of IP, uh, on top of TCP, they call the application level overlays. Um, 
And then they said, oh, we're going to do functional virtualization for all the functions that the IP uh, couldn't get delivered. But nevertheless, I should say that things worked out really well. That's how you know, they got used daily by millions of users. But look at the, 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 the last few examples that I showed you here, like a vehicle to vehicle networking. Here, I don't mean to say that my vehicle sends a signal to the next guy to say, hey, avoid collision. That I don't call it networking. This is just one hub notification. Uh, the vehicle to vehicle networking people envision is really like the vehicles talk to each other in the critical network. It's not just one hub signaling. And that, if you talk about academic publications, how many years have we, we been publishing that kind of papers? That's the first question. The second question is, where's the deployment? And if there's no deployment yet, which I think is the case, why? Uh, the next uh, big thing uh, has been talking a lot is about the home networking. Think of that you got a smart home, you can talk to everything. But again, um, your home networking isn't the home networking. Uh, I don't know how many people here tried the iPod, uh, the home kit. You, you order something from Amazon, it arrived. Now, can you just really plug it in so be part of your smart home uh, without bothering anybody else? You cannot. You cannot. Have, if you have tried, you have to have network connection so that up to the iCloud, they will have they would interfere with how you can configure this new gadgets into part of your smart home. Now, cloud worked out great, but again, we should ask the question, how come and why cloud has been so successful? Can we live the rest of our lives just on the cloud and without any uh, doing other things? Can the vehicle to vehicle networking get successful by depending on the cloud? Well, by the definition, it doesn't seem to be uh, fitted as well. Now, the latest thing I think everyone have heard is a virtual reality and the augmented reality. Some people may think that it's still far away. I think they are coming sooner, maybe, uh, than you expected. You see, we have a big uh, medical school. They are already talking to you about uh, how to uh, get VR and AR to facilitate like, the diagnosis of patients and even more exciting to apply AR in the uh, surgery. <clears throat> because humans, you know, they need the broader views of things to help. Uh, I'm yet to understand how that can help, but definitely that's a great new frontier in terms of networking. Uh, they all need networking to hook up things. The question is, is networking up to the challenge? Um, can the AR just use the cloud like everything else before it has been done. And that I want to pose as a challenge. I think the challenge really has a cause. All the problem has a cause. Right? You know, what we, what we imagine AR is really augmented reality. Now, I'm in this room. What I can see with the AR is not just the, what my eye could see, but rather the AR means that this reality my eye can see will be augmented by what? Anything you want. And, you know, I, I have a problem with remember anybody's names, but maybe with AR, as I look at you, your name somehow will show up. Uh, that's not far stretched. Uh, the, uh, when I was at home watching the Christmas uh, TV not long ago, not Christmas TV, the basketball games, um, and I noticed that some audience has a red nose in front. I said, how did they get that red nose in front? And my kids laughed at me. They said, they say, yeah. you know, you are in the real time television shows, people already kind of started decorating uh, the reality uh, with the augmentation. Those, I doubt, could be handled through that cloud, which may be 1,000 miles away and uh, uh, to, uh, React in real time. So there's a big difference, a uh, big problem that this uh, very simple hourglass picture didn't tell you. That is, the different layers actually do different things. Applications, 
they don't know IP addresses and they don't want to know. Applications, if you run a web application, uh, what you have is that you have HTTP request and HTTP reply, you get URL, you get the contents. So that's what the application does. Uh, network, on the other hand, that we all know and love, is an IP, IP size, everyone gets an address and they shoot your packets to it. So there is this fundamental difference, or I would say a mismatch. Mm. Now why would you care this mismatch given the IP has been doing so well? And I, I tell, here's why. Think about your laptop. You know, I said you run a web application. The application side, here's the HTTP request, get me this piece of data. But IP would say, give me an address, I send a packet to that address. How you convert from the first to the second? You require uh, some kind of uh, translation from the name to the addresses. And I tell you that the translation is not a trivial, just a lookup. Like in the old days, you look up your yellow page, oh, there's Mr. Smith, and here's the phone number. Now, DNS to IP translation goes far beyond that. Just like I said, when you try to uh, fetch the YouTube, not everybody actually talks to the same machine because it has lots of problems. Where you are, where the, the content is, how many people are trying to look, all the skilling issues. So therefore, um, DNS service itself, it's a gigantic um, the infrastructure service. And before that, you want to send the IP packets, you have to get the IP address first. So you require the DHCP is a deployed infrastructure services to really get you off the ground. Therefore, I think it's a very simple thing. You say you have an application, want something, and want to send the IP packet out. Behind the scene, there's a complex operations going on. Uh, so you really have the dependency on the infrastructure. Uh, and also, besides that, we also don't have very great uh, security built into the system as well. When I say the infrastructure, especially when you talk to new students, they don't believe there's any infrastructure needed. And I often use this example uh, to, to explain to them that you need something before you can actually network it. Say I'm here, I've been mumbling for so long, you want to see what other things at least you're gonna say for the rest of the hour. My file is on the um, slides, I'm just on my laptop, I'm just showing it off. If you, one of you, I call it Bob, uh, trying to get my slides, can you get it? Assuming that we turn off the DHCP, turn off the DNS, get rid of everything else, we can still have uh, uh, Wi-Fi. If, if no um, access points, my laptop runs Wi-Fi and your laptop runs Wi-Fi, we can run ad hoc Wi-Fi. The signal wise, we can reach each other. But I give you my file name. Can you get it under this very simple scenario where nothing exists but ad hoc Wi-Fi? Physically, you should. Because signal can reach each other. Just like when I talk, I say, hey, what time is now? You can answer me. Right, my voice goes through the air. There's a communication media, and you understand my question. Answer will come back. And uh, since uh, the security people very often talk about the Bob, we will have to mention Alice. So I put the Alice here too. Uh, we say that can Alice also talk to Bob and learn about my file and get a copy of that. Similarly, the difficulties. Uh, like I said, I can ask you a question, I get the answer back. And our machines can talk through the Wi-Fi just in the same way. But uh, how come they cannot do it? And this is our doing. Uh, I say that there are two other people, right? If we talk and say, what time is it now? You say it's about 10. And if the John and the, uh, Karen there, they can hear it as well. But that's not how we work today. How we work today, we put the IP in front of whatever data we want to send it out. Now, um, if I want to, my laptop wants to ask you what time is it now? What, what, what IP address do I put at the destination? And similarly, I need the IP address so the uh, answer can come back. Um, and what's that IP address? Besides IP, oh, 
actually, you know what, my application just doesn't understand IP. So what is the name I have to use to translate into IP? Those now become obstacles. For people who want to do this ad hoc networking, uh, for people who want to do like delay tolerant networking, and many things. So put the long story short, um, this is almost, I would say, more than a decade ago. Uh, this gentleman, John Jacobson, you probably don't recognize his name if you have studied ever uh, about the TCP injection control. But you may not have seen this uh, uh, Google talk he gave uh, in 2006. Uh, the basic talks about a new way to look at networking. Uh, I think even after 12 years, it's still worth uh, an hour to watch that talk. But if I just summarize the essence of that talk, at basic size. Today, we do uh, internet through this point-to-point uh, -point IP packet delivery. That no longer matches the requirements of the new applications, where most of them are based on the web platform. And that consists of uh, the request reply for data. So therefore, a better way to do networking is to really um, follow that wide semantics, but bring it down to a network layer. And so that part and led to a multi-campus uh, collaborative team, we decided to say this is a great vision, we're gonna work on that. And then we got funded by the US uh, National Science Foundation back in 2010, we gave the name, uh, called the name the data network. That just follows to say you request data by name and you get data by. So my machine is running without me. So uh, how does this uh, name the data networking works? Um, like we do architecture, I want to say, show you what's the big picture. Uh, look at this big picture. It's very, very similar to what IP uh, picture looks like. Uh, it's a still hourglass because it's a great architectural shape. Uh, with that narrow waist, you can have lots of changes below the, the middle, and you can have lots of new applications on top of the middle. And the two can evolve themselves quickly and independently without interfering with each other. The challenge is really how you design this middle so that they can take the best use of the underlying transmission uh, media to, uh, to serve the masters, the applications. In the IT design so far, we say that, well, we run our own business, we have our own namespace, uh, we call it addresses. So whatever you do, give me an address, I'll deliver your packets. And this new way of doing networking says that, and you know what, we serve the master of application, so therefore, we're just not gonna take your URL from an application and send out a request directly, equivalent, Name the data means that using that application name to request data, but now it's at a network layer, at the network layer directly. So that's why I printed uh, application all the way down to the network layer at the same color because they share the same addresses. So although the shape is the same, we can see already is one big difference. I have to use the names and then you have to use the address and then use the names. And immediately the next difference is that I have to use the address to name host. Actually, if you want to be precise, it's name an interface of a host. If you are multi-interface, you get multiple addresses per device. And in the end, when we say we use names, we're not naming host. You look at your URL, it's not a host, it's a name, the piece of data, HTTP object. So the name names data instead of a host or host interfaces. And immediately following that, there's another thing, which is that you name an IP packet with the address, that will deliver it. If you name a piece of object, um, UCLA, UCLA slash DCL slash web page, my page is gonna stay there going nowhere. So someone has to fetch it. And this change, change from um, address to name, um, address to host to name for data, lead to the third change that is 
Now, instead of we push the packet out, now this time you have to fetch the data. There's also one big change, uh, but I want to mention in the next slides. But this, that's three major changes. Still conceptually, the same problem, still our class. But the changes really uh, did to a fundamentally different ways. I will show you how this automatic thing can be done. That is, you can send a URL equivalent at the network layer. But I want to show if you can do it by backwards, and you can see how the picture gets changed. We remove that mismatch between the application and the networking. We no longer need that gigantic infrastructure just for two nodes to talk to each other. Because when I say, you know, um, request this data, by whatever means the other device get my request, then they can respond. If they don't have the response data, they can go out just carrying that request to say who has this data and then re return back to me. So therefore, it also frees uh, the responders who can send the reply to me. When I send the IP, IP packets out, it has to reach that particular host. But if I'm asking a question, the answer can come back from different uh, computers. As a matter of fact, that's what you're doing today. Um, when you say you look up YouTube, you have no clue which machine actually sent you back the answer. Uh, any of the many um, the hidden boxes that uh, Google already deployed. Or otherwise, when you, if you ever play the BitTorrent, you have to download some file. Right? Exactly who gave you individual pieces, you do not know and you do not care. Why you do not care? Because you can verify. Every piece of BitTorrent data champ, when you get, you can verify. Okay, to do the verification requires, there, there has to be security checking, the authentication that go with the data. So for the NDN network design, um, it's just like equivalent to HTTP request response. So we have an interest packet corresponding to request and the data packet corresponding to the response. And you can see there's, a, there's some differences here. The HTTP uh, reply comes back, it's just HTTP reply. Uh, when you put in the name H secure HTTP, that's a lie because HTTP is never secured. Uh, the so-called secure HTTP is basically running this HTTP exchange over an um, encrypted TCP channel. So HTTP itself doesn't really have a, a security, but in the end, every piece of data by architecture requirement must be authenticated uh, by the crypto signature. So how it works, whenever the producer produces any piece of data, you send it right away. This signature will bind the name to the contents. And after that, you don't really care where to get the stored cache because receivers can always, always verify whether the things uh, is got it is right. It's just like your turned data chunks. So when we're interested in the data, you throw out your request and get it. Um, because data is assigned, it can really come from anywhere. You may ask the question from where, other than the producers. That question will be answered later. But I'm gonna say uh, just a couple more details. Why is that for HTTP, you actually name a data object? It could be small, 200 bytes, it could be very large. Uh, that's the application layer. You do whatever you want. Now we're designing an NDN as a network layer protocol. A network layer has this intrinsic limitation called MTO. If you want to fetch network layer packets by name, you have to name every packet. You name every packet. Well, it's not hard. Um, I give you the example of my uh, uh, this presentation. I said, okay, here's my file name, which is at uh, version 20, because I changed it many times. I put the version number every time I make a change. And then you chop it into a segment so that each one will fit into one packet. I said two very important things here. One is um, NDN you name every packet. That's how you fetch it at the network layer. You fetch the data packet. 
And the second thing I said is that NDN use virginity so that data is immutable. Every time you make a change, you effectively produce a new version. And that new version has a new name. So therefore, the name to data binding never changes. And then this thing called obsolete, the concept does not exist for immutable data. You can only talk about which data is produced earlier, which one is produced later. But they do not obsolete in the sense that the name is still there, but the content changes. Uh, that doesn't happen with NDN. So now with NDN, now Bob can easily get the file from me. Uh, you send a request, and you know I came all this way uh, from LA La to Los Angeles, uh, to, from Los Angeles to India. I want to tell you how NDN works. So I'm more than happy to uh, send you back the reply. So we can see here that. You just send a request and data will come back. And in this data package, what I want to point out is that uh, how, do, how does my machine understand this discover uh, request? That's by naming conventions. Uh, say there's a well-defined keyword. When my machine receives that request, it knows how to interpret. Interpret by saying, oh, it requires for any publicly available data. And therefore, I will get sent back um, the information that matches that request. Uh, how I say the matches, if I have a pointer, uh, because the prefix, the matches the request prefix. And under that prefix, I will supply any names uh, that I'm willing to share. And in this reply, this will be the um, NDN interest packet, and this will be NDN data packet. And in the data packet, I will supply your additional information about the file, like how many packets in it, and therefore um, not used to this, so that if you have interest in fetching it, you can fetch it one interest for one data packet. And uh, if you want to fetch quick, you can pipeline in the interest that we know all about uh, how we do that. There's additional questions that people may have when I gave this talk earlier to say, what if in this room so many people want to share information? Are you going to have to send the discover? many, many times. Um, I use this example to give you an illustration of how the concept works. Um, if you talk about many people sharing uh, information in the local environment, we actually use a, a, a different concept called the data synchronization, where you know, when you send discover, actually I'm going to tell you, OK, here's all the available data you can get. That will include not just mine, but the other data that I have heard. Um, the data set synchronization is a very exciting topic. It is so useful in distributed applications, but I won't be able to uh, uh, say details. You can look at the, some of the literature uh, we have produced. Now let's bring Alice into the picture. So, okay, Alice wants to get the file. So even before Bob has asked. Now, what happens next? Assuming this is a really collaborative local environment, you know, Bob always helps Alice anyway so that uh, Bob will be able to forward the request to say, hey, what's information available in this room? And then uh, uh, get the response and send back to Alice. But exactly how this happened, if I'm not turning Bob into a HTTP proxy, we're talking still, remember, we're talking about a network layer. Network layer, just understand the, the, the names and then deliver it accordingly. So, so, in the end, you really want to build this uh, uh, kind of a data dissemination uh, environment where the concept of nodes disappears. All we have is that uh, someone requests for data, and whichever way uh, the data exists, the network will do this automatic then we'll get the data in the best way possible to, uh, to the requester. So I just show you some details to say that it's not automatic. This actually has been implemented uh, in the NDN code base. You know, for all of these machines running NDN, they essentially have this module called the uh, NDN forwarding daemon or NFD. How is the NDN forwarding daemon different from the IP module? First, it has a table that an IP doesn't. It's called a pending interest table. If you want to receive interest and send data back, you keep that pending interest table. 
Uh, this table works not just when you help other people to fetch data. It works even for yourself. And then treat all the interfaces to the network and also the faces to the application. We now all call the faces. So this NFT basically is a big switch. You can think that way. Okay, so all these faces, application, a local application can send requests out. It will put an um, entry into the pending interest table. Or otherwise, if I receive an interest, I want to have a forward, I put the entry in the forward interest table. Now, once you put the, the received interest there, then you figure out, okay, am I going to send it out? And which way to send it out? Maybe you have the data locally. Uh, you can just reply. Uh, like um, when my NFD receives the packet, it actually look up the application, the application will register for that prefix, it will send to that way. But in Bob's case, it's going to make a decision to say, well, how forward is the interest? Who makes the decision? There's another module in the NFD called forwarding strategy. This is also something that the IP box doesn't have. Because in the NDM uh, module, the, there are decisions to be made. So therefore, forwarding strategy is there to make the intelligent decisions. I'm going to say more about forwarding strategy later, but let's move on with our uh, story. So now that uh, uh, Bob can relay the request in, uh, uh, and get the reply back and forward, because you can see that the pending interest table has an outgoing interface. When data comes back, they can just uh, traverse that, that uh, has, it's already set up, and get the data back. So in the both interest and data packet, there's no address. Nowhere has this concept of so-called nodes. And yet, interest packet can be forwarded. Now I do this kind of a learning discovery. Um, and later, I'm going to tell you that um, interest packet can also be forwarded globally uh, if you run a routing protocol. So that, you know, Bob will know which of his interfaces is the best way to reach the request data. Uh, the uh, another thing I want to say is that, uh, so the data packet will get back uh, to the, uh, to the Alice. And what happens with the Bob, when the data packet gets to the Bob, what the next thing Bob can do besides the forward into Alice? <laughs> there is something that different. Um, you know, this reply I sent to Bob has nothing to do, well, it got there because Alice requested, but this packet itself has no indication this is actually for Alice only. In the packet, there's data, there's content, there's signature. So therefore, this packet can be thrown to anybody who wants to do discovery of the information in a given local context. Packets, data packets, is independent from requesters. Uh, so therefore, it can stand on its own. As such, in that NFT, there's a third module there, we call the content store. So therefore, the content store can catch, uh, catch any data that has been received. Just in case you know, someone else asks for the question, I look at my content store, oh, I have the answer, I can get you uh, right away. Not only you can help with uh, giving the answer to other people who ask, but also think about this way, that you know, what if the packet get lost? The wireless is so good, but not perfectly reliable. When packet get lost, and then learn from IP, we still do datagrams. There's no guarantee at the end layer to say, okay, we'll, we'll guarantee deliver you. But the Alice asks the question, never get answer back, you're going to retransmit. This is equivalent to that TCP, you don't get an IP, you're going to retransmit. The what happens, different from TCP, is that TCP's retransmission has to be end to end because nobody in the middle knows what's happening. Right? IP is a status, as we were told. Uh, in the end, on the other hand, the name identifies the data piece. And the data piece can come from anywhere, as long as a matching piece, piece gets funded. So therefore, um, 
the recovery will go half by half. I'm going to hit right at the nose where the loss happened in the next step. So that fundamentally changes how well the network can behave in the loss environment. Um, some people run simulations and I was amazed to see how come your NDM um, behaves so well because of this cache. Uh, so the next thing is about uh, uh, delay tolerance. See that Alex got the whole file, what she's going to do is she carry the file go on the bus. And on the bus, she might, you know, there are other people doing discoveries and she might share the file. And I would be very happy for lots of people to look at this stuff. Right. So what we just have said is actually something called the delay tolerance networking. And you carry the file, become data mill, you carry to other places and share with them. In today's IP, I think the delay tolerance networking was or has ever has been some big research area for some long time. And where is delay tolerance networking today? After I don't know how many papers get published. Where is it today? It's not that people don't have good solutions. It's just extremely difficult to have that uh, actually built into the system. But look here, what do we have done? We haven't done anything different, but rather the coherent, just the inherent design of NDN can accommodate uh, delay tolerance networking. Because all we needed is just to say that you can carry data, and data is independent from you know, the carrier, and data can be verified. So therefore, anyone who can get it. On the uh, bus, if Alice wants to share with people about uh, the file, which about the microbytes, so the best thing is you use this uh, near field communication. Now, among the phones, many interfaces, which way is the best way to use? Now, like I said earlier, there are many deci decisions the phone can make, and the following strategy will be the one to help make the decision. I'll tell you how that can happen later. Um, but the fundamental point this slide I want to show is host multi-homing has been quite challenging in the internet because the IP address is associated with each interface. So, um, and your, your packet only goes to one interface and you have to figure out a prior, which interface you should use. And that's how things get difficult. But here, because you don't care about the interface, the forwarding strategy will figure out, oh, I have four options, which one to go? Then you can make the option, um, the decision based on that. Now let's uh, go quickly to see exactly how this uh, automatic uh, NFD actually works, even in a large scale, so in the global scale. We actually have an Indian test bed, if people don't know, that runs across uh, four continents, four continents, so pretty long. So besides the three things we mentioned before, the following strategy, uh, content store and kind of interest table, you can see necessarily we need something that IP used today, the forwarding information base. That's where you listed, okay, for this prefix, now we use name prefix, uh, which we actually got. How you learn about that? In the early example I showed you, you can learn from self-learning. Try that out and see which one it works. Otherwise, you can learn from document paper. So this FAB has two differences from the FAB in the IP router. For one is this um, name prefix instead of uh, IP prefix. But for two, that's even more important, is that for next hub, you can list the menu. In today's IP router, how many next hub per prefix? One. Why you don't list the three? It's not because you don't have three alternative paths. I tell you, before in the end, I studied the routing. Uh, there's so many redundant paths in states because the network is so richly meshed up. But in routing, we can only send for the one next path because we are so worried about loops. Even with a single path forwarding, we still have loops. How come we don't care about loops here? Because remember, every time you forward the interest, you actually keep a copy in the forwarding uh, pending interest table. So therefore, if any interest ever look back, you know it and can kill the loop. This really frees you up to uh, try all the alternative paths and see which one works better. 
So uh, uh, the you know data producers instead of today, like UCL, we inject eight prefixes into global routing table, and you know in the end UCL just inject UCL individual into the uh, global routing table. Now you may ask the question I've been asked many times: How would this scale? Okay, UCI can inject it. What about me? I registered, um, like my son registered name, you know, foobars.com. If everyone registered their name and inject into the record table, how does it scale? Uh, I won't be able to mention that, answer that question, but I can point you to uh, some of the published paper talk about that problem, how we actually can solve that problem very effectively. Let's move on to uh, give you an overview of how exactly an interest can walk through this NFT and find the best way to bring data back. When the interest comes in, you see, do I have the cash? Uh, if you so, then the data already got go back. Otherwise, you ask this question to say, hey, I'm talking about this table, this table is mine. Um, have I seen this request before? If so, I don't have to uh, send it again. I just have to remember um, which interface the request actually comes in, so that when data comes, I will send back a copy to each of the interfaces I receive the request. Then, uh, uh, if you do, do not have a pit, pit, then you have to look up a fake. Where do I forward? Right? You have many options. Uh, you can also drop it. The decision will be made uh, in strategy. Not only you may forward along one interface, you can forward along multiple interfaces and just see which one can work better. How do you know which one works better? Because data will come back and that will, you will know. Uh, data comes back, you ask the question, did I ask for data? If you didn't, that is you cannot find the matching entry in your pit, you drop the data to avoid anyone did ask you by the gigantic data packets. If you can find the match entry in the pit, now you have measurement. How long does it take? You can estimate the throughput. Uh, do whatever things you want, because it's a close the feedback loop from the interest to data packet contact. You use that for your congestion control, for your load balancing. Oh, this way goes slower, that way goes faster. The, the throughput is different. How am I going to adjust my future interest forwarding? Um, then uh, you can uh, uh, send data back now to whoever asked for that. And then you put into your content store. Then you can remove the pit entry now. The job has been done. How many things I have talked so far? You can uh, mitigate DDoS. You can do measurement. You can do multicast delivery. And you can do caching. Those things, that's what we wanted to know. We wanted to have. You know, for the internet from many years now. Now we only have this one simple penny interest table that achieves all. So uh, um, now I want to say a few things about foreign strategy. You know, in today's internet, the routing plane now we call the control plane now. You know why? Because the routing controls, the forwarding knows nothing. You just shoot the packet out based on what the FIB says. But in the end, it entirely changed the relation. Because who is the boss now? The forwarding thing. The routing thing, well, basically, it provides the input to say, oh, if you want to forward this way, you may consider going. You may consider going. Because the consideration is by the forwarding strategy. It takes the input from the FIB, and say, oh, you give me three options. Then what I'm going to do is, um, I would consult my policies. What my policy says? You know, uh, will this interest be forwarded, be dropped, be split? Uh, and the more important thing, I have measurement data for the same prefixes. I would try this and try that, which way is better. Then uh, you can make a decision uh, accordingly. And people mentioned about the energies, right? Now in my policy, I can take into account how much energy I have through that forward. So uh, uh, I heard the comments from other people to say, this sounds pretty complicated. Uh, this is a lot more complicated than IP dodgers. Is it so? Let's uh, look at this. Yes, we well, added the, the, the content store. 
But you can see how much the kind of store actually help, help the network to bring back the data the user wanted. That's the whole purpose for the network to exist in the first place, right? You can uh, really speed up the delivery and reduce the network load. That is, you have a click and you can institute. So therefore, it's justified for the existence. For the pit, um, you have multicast built in. Multicast always requires a state. That's from day one when that was a design. And you have the feedback loop so that you can do all of these things everyone wants to do for many years. The difference is that today we do congestion in one way, we do load balancing in a different way, and the measurement yet some other means to try. Here we have one pit. It does all. The reason is because pit is stored state, but it's a per packet, per hub state. So find is the granularity of the unit the network actually handles. If you have that state, it really allows you to uh, get all the information uh, you needed for your actions. And people also talk about DDoS. We have papers developed. Uh, we're going to just skip that. And last, I want to mention something a little more philosophical. People say it's too complicated. We want to save. Look at your user, the, the name, how long it is. I think we only have four bytes address. Your name, definitely longer than four bytes. What's the answer to that? I, my answer is always that it looks like IP routers. It's way more complex than the telephony switches. Now, why is that a more simpler telephony switch today? It gets replaced by the more complicated IP routers. Why? Because the technology moves forward. You cannot say, now I take four bytes to the business, so I always take four bytes. It's always a better solution than the, the, the other things that are going to take 40. That's not the answer. The technology moves forward is for you to use that technology to better serve the, uh, the users. And you cannot use the same absolute number to judge whether you are moving to a better technology or otherwise. So we have that paper that gives a uh, detailed discussion. Now, I'm trying to say something about the NDN. NDN can do many magic, but fundamentally, it's a name. That's why we change the name. We will use the name, name the data network. Uh, it's the same name you can use um, for multiple interfaces. You can have automatic the, the information discovery just throughout your request and see who has it for it. And you can support ad hoc delay not current networking and the same thing used across all the layers. Many years people have been talking about cross layer optimization. Now you got it. You know exactly what the upper layer is asking for. So the lower, lower layer knows how to handle it. Um, the next thing is about security. How is naming data really help the security? Because now the data has a name. You sign it so that you secure the data directly. You can also uh, encapsulate that as we have done. The most important thing is that security is not about crypto. Security is about the key management. Which keys can send which data? And how you verify the keys? Those are the hard questions. So those are standard things, authentication, confidentiality, and availability. That's all the same, whether IP or NDN. Uh, what in the end makes a difference is that uh, you can do this automatically. Uh, for support redundancy, for availability, we have talked about a lot, so I'm going to focus on how we can handle the crypto keys in an automatic way. Uh, I'm a little late, so I'm going to go very uh, quickly. Some details. Um, I didn't mention earlier that is in the crypto signature, it has a pointer to the signing key. It's basically just a name. And with that name, you can fetch the key. But now you say, I received the package signed by UCLA. Fine. What is UCLA's key? How do I get it? That's another big question out there. But in the end, every single piece of name, the data. You want to know something? Give me the name, that will fetch for it. Uh, the interest can also be secured as needed, but I will skip that. So, how you can use the crypto in the NDN? 
basically you do signing, you do verification. Uh, this is standard things to do, um, do the encryption. What the NDN differs is we use the names, and name, name the data can carry the security policies, um, can carry the keys, that makes things uh, easier. So I think instead of going through this one by one, let me just give you uh, some uh, uh, pointers so that people can pursue it uh, later on their own uh, things. So essentially, let me go up this one. Essentially, you know, you send things and you need to do verifications. So and then what I will give you is uh, once you define your policy, all this key uh, management, which key send what data, and who can decrypt your data, these things can be all built into the library automatically. And the whole, those are the references. Uh, this thing I really want to say because I got asked many times to say you violate end to end principle, left and right. You get data from anywhere. Yes, but that's the only way you can scale. If everyone pound on the same server, it will melt quickly. Uh, today, you really don't talk to the same server anymore. So the end to end has to be considered uh, in a new light. Because you don't talk to the same server, so the, the so-called end-to-end no longer, well, band large exists today. When you talk to your bank, your HTTPS request, where does it end? You think it's your bank server. I don't know about in India, but in, in US, I have actually looked. It doesn't end up in your bank server. It's end up in the middle box. And the middle box run by others, not your bank, do security check. So you already lost the so-called end-to-end security today. Now, what the Indian does is that, oops, we understand that you may not be able to directly talk to the other end you want to talk to. At least we'll make sure that the data you get is produced by the other end that you wanted to get data from. So that's actually the true end-to-end -end security in today's environment, where you know uh, you have to scale. You don't talk to the same server, and also you have intermittent connectivity, uh, and you don't have the chance to talk to the same to the end if two ends are not online at the same time. So to summarize, and there's really three simple ideas: name data, secure data, and stateful forwarding. With the different combinations of those three things, you can get us benefit, like I already mentioned. You can catch data now because the data can be verified, doesn't matter where it comes. You can do multicast now because it's stateful forwarding and you name the data. And this uh, uh, stateful forwarding provides you all these advantages. And I want to really point it out that you do the measurement that help you make the better decisions uh, for the future. Uh, for the attacks, you can inject the bad data into the system. Signature will help uh, detect and verify and uh, you know, get around the problems. You cannot kill the bad guy in real time. You can get around it. So these three things provide you this really resilient data delivery. Um, let me just say, with all of that, where we are getting to. So what we are getting to is uh, network. Network does one thing, delivers your data. Network runs the routing protocol. Knows exactly which best way to get your data. But today, when we do like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, where is that sharing? It's an application layer. And you lost the touch with the network. You don't know who is nearest to you. You don't know whether you actually cross your ISP boundary and make them unhappy when you download the 10 gigabits gigabytes of files. If you do all of this content fetching at the network layer, that actually solves the problem. It combines the network power, knowing what things were and which way to go with the semantic understanding of exactly what you want to get. And that's where the, all this uh, uh, power comes from. So the fundamental question of networking is that what the namespace you use. And in the end, we say, we just use whatever applications you use. And that will enable you to do the same thing, like ask a question, your machines can also talk to each other directly um, without any intermediate translations. 
So this will enable uh, infrastructure-free applications. I don't mean to say infrastructure is not good, cloud is not good, it's great, but don't depend on it. Uh, when the Amazon had a glitch, I still want to open my door. I, I don't want to be just uh, shut outside. And uh, to close up, I want to say that once you can request data by semantic meaningful names at the network layer, you actually can integrate not only networking, but the storage and the processing. Why? Because you can express what you want. For seven years of doing NDN research, one thing we appreciate the most is the expressive power of that name. You can ask for the things that doesn't exist yet. I ask, you know, where now this to let me just go. So these days, uh, we're doing this uh, uh, joint project funded by uh, NSF and Intel. Uh, the, the requirements are very simple. Run the latest application over NDN over wireless. Where's the IP? We don't need IP. Especially at the edge, you can run anything you want. How do you do it? Because NDN talks semantic names at the um, network layer. Like this really needs to be uh, sent in the environment along my hallway. Well, my old hallway, I just moved the office. You can see that you, know, you pull off your phone, your phone talks to your environment, and you gather the data you want. So without any translation, without any infrastructure, it's purely over Wi Fi, Bluetooth. Um, it's about, okay, I'm here. You cannot see clearly this actually Professor Klenrock, you know, one of another Internet Fathers. And it tells you that down that hallway, the talk going on given by uh, Alex. Um, that's the only simple sense. The, the more advanced things is that not only we can sense in the net environment, we can uh, request the services. Uh, we build some prototype to say my phone actually um, recording the video, and the video will be um, processed by some uh, machine learning to do the object identification and then face recognition so that you can really add the semantics to say what's going on. And with that, then you can request related information. You know, oh, this is a design meeting, and it will automatically supply you with additional things. So here you can see that there's a many to many communication. When you say you want your video to be analyzed, which server do you talk to? Which server do you talk to? Well, in the end, how does a server get a request in? Let other people know what you are. You say, you say, I do machine learning. So therefore my request with the machine learning as a part of their name will get sucked into that machine learning server. And the result will come back to me. With that, you really uh, blended processing, networking, and storage into one named semantic network. So, uh, uh, so to the end, I just want to remember this is where we started by talking about internet architecture. Very simple, three pieces. The middle one being most important. So I think the future of the internet really relies on recognize the right abstraction model for that network layer. And we started many, you know, hundreds of years back, we have the telephone, the network layer model is the circuit. And then we moved to IP, the network layer model. It's a packet switching, but still a virtual circuit between two ends. It's a great virtual circuit, but nevertheless, it's a circuit. And in the insights, we now really need to move the semantics of the network service to become uh, requesting for named data. So over seven years, we have built uh, quite a lot of things that are running code base. It runs not only in the local environment, we also build a test bed. Um, it's our website, you should take a look. And I want to tell you there are still so many great challenges ahead of us, and I hope people will become interested. Uh, so look into that, you can help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk and a glimpse into the future of the internet. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll only have a couple of questions. Uh, so.
Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, what I have understood from the talk, if uh, you have, if you are addressing the host, if that has to be changed to address the entire URL by name, because that's what is named data networking, where you are addressing the entire URL by the name. Then, if the name has to be addressed, you have a single URL. Will this, will that not be a huge task, because you are replacing the entire URL by the name? So, will it not be a very complex task? Uh, I think you maybe you meant to say the name will be long as opposed to complex. because you are searching with single name. You say when you send the IPv6 packet out, the destination is 16 bytes. It's pretty long. The router doesn't really look at 16 bytes per se. They look at the prefix. The same thing for the uh, forwarding of the names. Will it not be a huge search space? You, for the uh, name? You, you do the language the match, just like what we do today with the IP table lookup. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one more, uh, will this still be connected with the internet? Will this, will this, can this be uh, run through the internet, existing internet? Uh, if I ask back, did the, the internet interact with the telephone network? I think people who has a memory could answer that question. Uh, I have two questions. So how does this performance compare with other ad hoc routing protocols like EODP, DSDP, and things? Uh, this is one question. And the other question is, have you compared the performance with uh, uh, internet routing and uh, the performance in terms of delay throughput, RTD? So how does that compare? I don't think I heard your first question very uh, clearly for the uh, second so, question. Uh, okay, so I understand that this is uh, an ad hoc routing uh, kind of scenario. So there are some ad hoc routing protocols uh, in the later result before run, like A AODB ad hoc on demand routing, DSR dynamic source routing. Uh, so uh, for the sake of time, I didn't get into ad hoc routing. I want to say one thing it's really the insight. Today in IP, when you computers come together at hack, you have to run a routing protocol. Why? Because otherwise, how do you know which computer is where? You have no clue. You send packet out. You don't know whether it succeeded or failed. In NDN, in small scale, you do not need a routing per se. You do the discovery, and when data comes back, you already found the successful pass. Because the forwarding is stateful. That really replaces routing. What is routing? Routing is a broadcast. OK, say, hey, I'm here if you want to reach me. Yeah, in the end, you don't have broadcast as routing, say. You just broadcast your question directly. And then it will find its way back. OK, this is really works well in the small scale at hard environments. And the uh, IP cannot do it because the data plane is status. You broadcast, you learn nothing. There's no feedback. Oh. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, in the interest of time, we're going to cut short the questions. And tea break is right after. I'm sure ma'am will be happy to uh, have it offline. One second, madam. If uh, I can just invite our general chair, uh, Mr. Ram, to present a token of appreciation. Before that, I say that. Uh, there's some printout about the NDN, so whoever is interested, you can bring a, uh, grab a hard copy and take a more look. We have all the information in it. Uh, if I can just invite you a little uh, on stage to accept the memento and the volunteers to just move the lamp. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over for the demo and spotlight.